What if you were free to be exactly who you needed to be in your role as a leader? If you could utilize your skill sets, your knowledge, and your passion to drive forward your mission in a way that led to being as successful as you know you could be. You didn't have to deal with busy work or bureaucracy, and you could come into the fullness of your role. My next guest, Jason Howard, talks about A-plus hires and the methodology that's necessary to bring them into your organization in order to maximize your potential and be exactly who you need to be for your organization. Jason Howard is the General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer of Tegas Incorporated, a global provider of investment research tools. Formerly, he was at the SEC as an enforcement attorney. He's a husband and father to two adorable girls. He's also a near and dear friend. Please welcome Jason Howard. All right. Very special episode and very special guest here today. Jason Howard is a longtime friend. Um, I almost said old friend, but that wouldn't be fair to you, Jason. <laughs> you're, <laughs> yeah, you're a longtime friend. Um, we've known each other for how many years would you say now? Oh, gosh. Um, I think we met right after, not long after I got married. So going on the 13, 14 years now, maybe. Yeah. So it's been, uh, been very cool over these years to see your professional progress and see how you've really risen in the ranks um, from your work with the government and now in the private sector. And uh, I'm wondering, Jason, if you can share just a little bit about um, that journey and that trajectory, um, what's led to this great success that you've had? Yeah, it's it's definitely a non-traditional path, I would say. I think, you know, if you were just to look at my uh, my LinkedIn profile or my my resume, you'd see that I started my career basically in government service, going back all the way to college. Um, so I worked for a county administrator when I was uh, in undergrad, and then after I graduated, I went and worked for the government in D.C. When I worked for the Senate for a little bit, and so I was very focused on government positions, and then. Coming out of law school, um, I had an internship with the Securities and Exchange Commission, and then I had another internship with the U.S. Attorney's Office. So again, very focused on government positions. And indeed, the first 13 years of my, my legal career were at the SEC in the government, um, which is very different. Uh, and then, you know, I think I, I faced a choice of do I stay in public service and become a lifer, so to speak, in government, which would have been completely satisfactory. It was a great job, great career. Um, or do I make a move and try something different? Do I challenge myself in right. a different way? And that's what led me to leave the government, go into the private sector, and ultimately how I ended up at Tegas, which has been really the, the right now, like the crowning achievement of my career in terms of the challenges that I face and the, the, um, level of responsibility that I've been, you know, that's been entrusted me at Tegas. So it's been a, it's been a very winding road, uh, again, non-traditional path, but it's been highly, uh, highly, I wouldn't say highly successful, but very valuable intrinsically to me. Um, you know, from every outside perspective, um, I, I would say, you know, certifiably, um, a successful career um, to you know achieve what you have, um, I think is enviable for a lot of people. Um, but I think the way that you've gone about it, the way that you've done it, uh, with I think you know tact and um, really maintaining the the core values of of who you are, um, i.e., not selling out. Um, to me, that is a great success. Um, <laughs> I, I just have to share um, when I, when I first met you. And you were working for the SEC. Um, you had a badge, and that was the coolest thing to see you whip that out. Sometimes, <laughs> as a, an official government um, lawyer, there. 
<laughs> yeah, that's where the that's where the aura of the position uh, kind of sometimes outweighs the reality. The my badge was really just my ID holder; <laughs> didn't have any more power or influence than my my business card did. But it, you know, it was a very it, it is an interesting position. I think my my start at the government is is probably the catalyst. What you know, if, if you want to kind of view my career as successful, you know, I think. A lot of that success is rooted in the lessons I learned at the government in a, in a number of different ways. But one of the most important one is that working at the government, usually they heap a lot of responsibility on you early on. And so I had the opportunity to do amazing things early on in my legal career um, that a lot of people didn't get a chance to do, frankly. Right. I didn't I wasn't just stuck reviewing documents in some office. I was out there, you know, you know reviewing evidence, taking testimonies or doing depositions of, of witnesses and, and people like that. And it was very interesting. I learned a lot, was able to see an, you know, kind of the entire legal process from start to finish. And I think that really informed my view of not only the import of each thing that I did day to day, but also gave me a, an understanding of the weight of the entire legal process. And I also saw firsthand like how it impacted people and that really made an impression on me about, you know, that's, there's this prosecu prosecutorial discretion that you get when you're in a position like I was in that you need to wield carefully. And I see it to this day when I see the SEC taking actions in certain ways that, you know, if you're dealing with people's lives. You know, one of the things you mentioned is you want to talk about the people-centered navigation of compliance. And really when it comes to regulators and regulated space, you know, they can have a very serious impact on people's lives. You know, as uh, my boss always told me that, you know, sending out a subpoena or sitting down for a deposition with a witness might be routine to me. It might be the day to day thing that I do. And it's just my job, but it's very likely the most important or more significant, one of the most significant things that's happened in that person's life. And you have to think about that and be empathetic when you're sitting across to them, because really you're just trying to get at answers and do your job. But need to work with humans on the other side to get that done to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. I love that. And and I think it can be it, it can be so easy to get caught up in the bureaucracy of of a position. And a lot of the clients that I work with um, work for small governments, city and county governments and the the compliance uh, just signing contracts is a challenge, but um, the the compliance uh, part of that is um, can oftentimes overshadow the good work that people are trying to do. And, um, and I really appreciate that you come back and, and recenter on that idea, you know, that, that we're working with real humans that, you know, these decisions impact their lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So now at Tegas, you are in the C-suite, my friends. Uh, you are in the the upper echelon of you know this organization, and you know working in this position, um, assumably you have a lot of influence over um, you know people in in the organization, the day to day, and affect their lives in you know maybe similar ways um, that um, you did back at the SEC. So I'm curious, um, how do you really maintain that? you know, people centered focus in, in the day to day now in the corporate space. Yeah. Well, that, that sounds very lofty and I appreciate it. Um, but I think, you know, yeah, I, I, and I don't, I'm not belittling the importance of, of my position in my job. I, I agree with you. Um, I do get to work with, you know, with our, our C-suite, with our CEOs and our CFO and everybody else at Tegas, but I also get to work with and just an incredible team that is our compliance operations team and a couple other teams that I work with at Tegas that are all, you know, some entry level, most very early in their careers. And they're people I work with on a day to day basis. So it's kind of easy to stay rooted in that and understand that the decisions I'm making or the decisions we're making at a leadership level are impacting not only our customers and others we work with, but also with, you know, our, our other team and team members. Um, and so I get to work with them on a daily basis and kind of keeps me centered in that way, which is great. But I think also for, for me, for being in compliance and, and being 
you know, in, on the legal team. So wearing both hats, right? The traditional hats of general counsel and chief compliance officer, you know, I, I basically deal with setting policy, making sure people are following rules and things like that. Very boring stuff in general. Sure. But when it comes to focusing on the people that it, that, in, that it impacts and that you're trying to influence their behaviors, you know, you, you have to kind of stay centered on the people and their personalities and how they're going to receive the rule or the information or the policy that you're handing down because really compliance is just about following rules, right? And you're trying to get people to follow those rules. So you have to know them, you have to understand them, you have to empathize with them. And then you also have to work with them to explain why you're doing things, right? And so I think for me, that's, I, I hope that's why I'm good at my job is like, I always focus on like, all right, why are we doing this? Is there a reason for this policy? Is there a reason we're asking our team members to, to do this or that? And if right. you can explain to them the why behind it, Usually you can get them on board with following that rule, you know, being on board with, with maintaining those policies and that sort of thing. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And your team has grown quite a bit. Um, I, I think I remember that yours is a newly created role and your department has grown exponentially in your time there, right? Yeah. So I started in January of 2020. So I'm just over three years now in the seat. When I first joined Tegas, there were only three people on the compliance team. I was actually brought on as the vice president of compliance and you know, kind of threw on general counsel, I think, because I had my law degree. But Tegas is a relatively small company. I think we were only around 47 to 50 people total when I joined. Fast forward to today, we're over, well over 600 people. We're global with, you know, with um, entities in, wow. in Ireland and in Canada and you know, employees all over the, the country and also the globe. And then my team alone is bigger than Tegas was when I first joined. So I've got about 46 people on my team. It includes our legal department, our traditional compliance team, um, which we refer to as enterprise compliance risk management. And then this fun thing that we call compliance operations at Tegas or comp ops, which is what I was really brought in originally to do. And that's the bulk of my team. And that's the, the people I was referring to earlier. And that's where we've had most of our growth. And it's been it's been exciting, but it's also daunting, right? Because you go from an organization where you're just kind of working next to someone and you get to build these very deep relationships with, and it gets just harder and harder to do that as the company grows. And you have to sure. be very mindful and intentional about setting aside time and carving out time to, to keep those relationships moving like that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, speaking of those relationships, I, I'm sure, you know, you find yourself in a mentorship position quite often in this role. So what's the number one thing that you like to teach people that you work with um, besides, you know, just making them follow the rules? Um, you have the opportunity to to share knowledge with them. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, um, you know, gosh, I think. I feel getting back to your first comment about being an old friend. I do, I do at times feel very old and I joke a lot that when I first joined Tegas, I think I was probably the, if not one of the oldest people who worked there, which is a very big change from being like one of the youngest people at the government to being one of the oldest people at Tegas. Sure. But I feel like there's a responsibility in there to share some of the lessons that I've learned over the course of my career that I think are more important than some of the more tactical things that I can teach my team. A lot of that's like resiliency that, you know, that it's okay to make mistakes. You know, I think especially in, in my world, people are so fearful of making mistakes and yes, mistakes in the compliance and legal world can be bad, but we're human. Right. And so right. mistakes happen and what, what's important is how you deal with them. And so really the, I think the number one thing that I hope I impart to my team and especially my direct reports is, is openness, transparency, and honesty. I think when you have those things, you can build a strong team that can handle challenges, they can deal with mistakes they make and, and move forward and grow and become stronger. If you don't have those things, I think things tend to fester. So if you have a culture where people are afraid of making a mistake, then you're gonna breed a culture where people cover up mistakes. Sure. And in the compliance world, when you cover up mistakes, they just get worse, they don't go away. They just get worse and worse and worse. And I saw that from my early days at the SEC when I would do an investigation and you see something that is very simple and it was kind of like a foot fault that develops into a criminal case because 
someone decided to lie, cover up and, and, right. and conspire to avoid things. And, and that's for me, I really want to build a culture of transparency, openness, where people aren't afraid of coming to me and talking to me, no matter who it is on my team. That's great. And that, that integrity um, seems like it's interwoven into the culture there. So how do you, when you're hiring, which you've done quite a bit of, how do you really look for those people that you know are going to fit into that culture and, and, you know, really rise with this fast growing company? Yeah. It's not easy, but again, and I hate to lean on this so much, but I think transparency again is the key. And I, and I say that because during the interview process, we are very forthcoming about what the job entails, um, what the responsibilities are, what the work expectations are, what the pace can be like. Working at a high growth startup like Tegas is, is not easy. We don't shy away from that. And we're honest about it. We don't make people think that they're going to be able to sit there and kick their feet up on the desk and, you know, doodle for four hours a day, right? It's, it's hard work. We're very honest about that. We're very transparent about that. We're also very transparent about our expectations and the performance expectations that we have. And so I think when you do that upfront, there's no surprises when people come on board. And the only way to communicate those things is by having open conversations with the people that you're recruiting and trying to bring on. And when you have those open conversations, they open up, they ask questions. So you kind of like you start off the relationship with everyone understanding what each party expects. And I think that just starts things off on the right foot. They don't always go perfectly, right? Sometimes you have a mismatch, but I think the more honest and forthright you are during the recruiting process, um, I, I think the more likely you are to have a successful hire that's going to share that energy. I think the other, I think the other important aspect of what we do is, and, and it, I don't, it didn't take a lot to get right. I think really the, the, the secret sauce, so to speak, for my team has been, we started with just incredible people on the compliance team that I work mm -hmm. with that were there before I even joined Tegas. And my job was easy. I just went out and looked for more of them. I was like, how do we replicate this person? How do we go out and find someone who's going to do the job exactly like she does? And then we find that person and then you keep replicating it. But that it's an easy model to set up and to find that first, those first few people, but then you have to tend to it. So like now I'm far removed from the hiring process for the entry level of compliance associates we have, but we've kind of imparted that lesson and taught those lessons to the people who are now doing the hiring. So we kind of teach down so they can continue to develop from the very ground up. And I think we've done a really good job of replicating the success we've had with the early career compliance folks at Tigers. So it sounds like, you know, if you have a great template for, you know, for a hire, for a position, then hiring to, you know, to fit that and, and continuing to, you know, kind of scale that really is, is the way to go. I'm thinking of, you know, listeners of the show who might not be in a position, you know, like you are, uh, maybe they're in a small organization working, you know, uh, locally, um, they may not have these kind of resources, but looking to, you know, the model that, you know, you present at Tegas or, you know, other great organizations out there and, you know, paying attention to what they do is I think a fantastic opportunity to build those templates in, um, something we're working on at, uh, five bridges right now, a lot is, um, our, our SOPs, really locking down just the day-to-day -day operations um, in order to scale. Um, I'm so used to doing everything myself that it's hard for me to remove myself as that funnel, as that sort of pinch point of growth. Um, but how can I replicate? How can I, you know, really just capture what I do, that, that sort of X factor and create a template for others to follow and hopefully keep infusing that energy into it. So um, I, I want to drill down into this a little more. So as you're scaling and as you're, you're really teaching, you know, those on your team, how to, how to continue to do what you've been doing, there's, there's sometimes a nuance there. Um, and, and, and for me, I, I find it difficult to translate, um, you know, that, that X factor or that, you know, maybe divergent thinking where you're 
really trying to look for something that maybe isn't on a resume, um, how do how do you teach that? How do you translate that? And I know we're we're talking like very um, you know very I, I, ideas here, um, but I, I if you can help me translate this to listeners, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I think you know it, there's a couple things there. One with the hiring process, our, we follow a pretty rigid's not the right word, but kind of a um, we have a template for hiring basically, where we have very specific questions we ask that are designed to elicit honest responses, uh, and we kind of we're very intentional about roles we're hiring for, the skills we're looking for. And so when we ask the right questions, we usually tease out the answers that we need to decide whether or not someone's the right fit. Um, that's number one. Number two is that we're very in depth on the referral process, right? On, on getting references uh, and really understanding what, you know, getting behind, getting behind the resume, getting behind the, the, the polished answers during the interview and like finding out like, what was this person really like to work with? Mm. I think one of the, my biggest shocks when I joined Tegas was the depth of the reference checks that they did. Not only did they ask for a specific list of references, but they also asked, I remember our CEO asked us if it was okay if they just kind of checked out my LinkedIn profile and, you know, or if they were okay with, or if I was okay with them reaching out to some other people they saw that they found interesting to talk to. So <laughs> after I had, you know, I had the interview process, I'd get calls from people I had worked with at the SEC a sure. decade ago. And they'd be like, I had a call from a company named Tegas. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, and so like they really, but they, but through that process, they learned all kinds of things about me that, you know, things that I don't really share in an interview process. Like there's some things that, that I've, I've been through that I didn't bring up myself, but some of my former colleagues did like, did you know, sure. Jason did this or did you know, Jason did that? And then, you know, they'd ask me about it, et cetera. And so I think that's one, another good way of actually figuring out, uh, what someone's like is actually talking to people they worked with like because the you know someone actually sat in the trenches with them but getting away from the hiring process and and focusing more on like how we do it you know when you're you know you reference building sops it's kind of similar like just the whole scaling process whether it's hiring or whether it's trying to replicate yourself as you said it's it's all really about aligning on like key values key principles, making sure that you're sharing your views transparently about, you know, higher level concepts so that the people that you do bring on, you can trust them to execute on your behalf in a way that you would approve of or that you would do yourself because you're all following the same principles. You're all trying to achieve the same, you know, same objectives. You all are working towards the same you know, North star, if that makes sense. Right. Like, sure. so if you develop those, if you develop those values, if there is intention behind them and that, and there's buy-in across the organization, it's easy to get those, you know, that replication effect, so to speak. Yeah. That, I see it. My team ever, like it's one of the fa my favorite things about my job is I get to watch, I've watched my team grow, but every once in a while I'm like, I'm very, sometimes a little scared, but also very surprised and, and just amazed with what my team does on a day-to-day -day basis, even things that I don't know that they've started, initiatives that they've done because they know it's in the best interest of the company and it aligns with where we are going directionally. But I might not know the nitty gritty, on, you know, the day-to-day -day basis of what they're doing. I'll find out in an update email or something like that. I'm like, whoa, I didn't know you guys were doing that. That's amazing, but it's exactly what I want you guys doing. And when you, when you see that in practice, when you see it happen, it's, it's magical. Well, and I think that's indicative of a great leader to have trust in the people that you work with and not needing to control every single thing that they do um, to, to really understand that if you've made a great hire, they can go on without you. And that's, that's hopefully the goal, right? Is if you, if you make yourself irreplaceable, then you can never grow in your position. Uh, you have to replace yourself with people who, who can do what you do and hopefully do it better. So looking towards the future, um, I wanted to just bring it back to a personal note. Um, 
so as a, a longtime friend, uh, Jason, you have taken up the charge of uh, training for the Chicago Marathon with me. <laughs> this is uh, a, a, a huge deal um, for me, you know, to have you know such a good friend um, running alongside me. I, I think um, it it's new for me. I'm not a distance runner at all. Um, so to, to undertake something like this is, uh, is pretty daunting and, um, and I'm, I'm glad to, to have you alongside and supporting no stigmas doing that. Um, you have done some marathon training in the past. Um, so can you give me a, a little preview of, of what to expect as I'm at, you know, week three of my training right now? <laughs> yeah. Uh, training might be, uh, overloading it. Surviving is probably a, a more appropriate <laughs> word, but you know, I think, <laughs> you, know, I think it's, you know me well enough. Like I'm no great athlete, right. I, and I, yes, I played team sports when I was young and in high school. And, you know, I think I really kind of found my footing a little bit when I joined the swim team and, and I realized like football now, my friend, do not discount yourself. <laughs> flag football. But most of the things I've, uh, if you want to call it success, be it on, on a court, a field or a track or whatever it is, it has nothing to do with athletic ability and a lot to do with my stubbornness uh, more than anything. And like, you know, just the drive to set a goal and try to achieve it um, come hell or high water. And I think for marathon training, for me, really actually started with triathlon training. I don't even remember why I got into it. I think part of it was because like, Oh, the swimming, everyone says the swimming is the hardest part and I can swim. So let's do that. Um, and the biking and the cycling and the running for me were a big challenge. And so training for that, the first longer distance triathlon I, I did kind of got me hooked and it made me realize like, okay, endurance sports is where I can actually perform at a level that I, I'm proud of, right? Like I'm not going to finish in the top 10 or anything like that, but for me, those types of endeavors are much more about, about competing against yourself. And so it's a space where I learned that I can set goals for myself that are tough. Um, but if I achieve them, I'll feel, you know, I'll feel that reward, that intrinsic reward you get. And that's the satisfaction I get out of it in terms of tr how that translates to training for the marathon. I think you really have to rein in that competitive aspect. You have to mm -hmm. rein in that, that goal of you, you see people set benchmarks, like I'm going to, you know, a, the great marathon time is four hours or right. great triathlon time is this. And I think people get it in their head. Like that's the mark I need to hit. Mm -hmm. And I tried to do that the first time I ran the marathon. I've actually signed up for the marathon, I think two or three times. And I only ran it and completed it once because of injury and things like that. And every time I got injured, it's because I overdid it trying to achieve something that I just frankly probably can't achieve trying to do a sub four marathon or run crazy per minute mile times, as right. opposed to saying, what's a good accomplishment for Jason? What can I do? And, and how can I get there in this time frame? right? You can't rush marathon training. Like there's a reason that it's very, it's a very long training schedule. And it's very intentional about how you ramp up your miles. If you go too quick, you're going to overdo it. You're going to get hurt. You're going to set yourself back and you're going to run out of time before the actual marathon date comes along. So there's this discipline that goes along with it. And I'm sure there's some clever tie in to my career choices and things like that, that go along with endurance sports, but, um, uh, it probably all boils down to my stubbornness really. Well, I'll make that tie in because I, I think another word for stubbornness is perseverance. And that's something that I, I see in you um, that is, you know, one of your core values and has, you know, followed you um, certainly throughout your career and, you know, something that you bring into this leadership role. Um, so, you know, looking forward to, you know, what you want to accomplish in your career, in your time at Tegas and, you know, beyond. Um, you know, I, I've been reflecting on this a lot, um, b being a new father, this sort of marathon mindset, um, when it comes to life, when it comes to longevity, my career, my relationships. And, um, and that seems to be pretty intrinsic to, um, who you are and, and what you do. So I'm curious, you know, where you see yourself going, what's, what's next for Jason as he continues his marathon at Tegas. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. I think 
I think when I joined Tegas, I didn't, I didn't know, frankly. Um, I think I was looking for the next step, but I didn't know what that step was, nor did I know what it was going to lead to. Mm -hmm. As I sit here today, I think I can see, I can see the field of play in front of me a little bit better. Um, and so kind of, you know, like endurance training, I, I kind of see what I'm capable of and what the opportunity is ahead for Tegas. And to me, it's incredible. I think we have so much opportunity ahead of us to make an impact on not only our core customer base that we're serving today in a very, very impactful way, um, but also the, the compliance users that use Tegas and that I get to interact with every day and that my team supports every single day. Like we've only really, we've only really kind of showed the tip of the iceberg of mm. what's possible in our space within this little industry. And my goal and my, what I think is going to be my great joy over the next several years is really demonstrating how much value we can provide to our customers, how we can use things that are usually boring and esoteric and things that people shy away from like compliance and turn them into a real value proposition for not only Tegas, but for our customers. It's an opportunity that um, I didn't realize how much it was there when I first joined. But now that I'm here and I see the value that my team provides to our customers, um, that's where a lot of the fun is. Like I, I get to take what's normally a kind of a boring job and I, you know, kind of tritely refer to it as the best compliance job in the world at Tegas. And I mean that because we're able to take something that is viewed as boring by people outside of the actual compliance department and turn it into something that's actually meaningful and that's helping our customers in a bunch of different ways, protecting them from, from things that could do them harm and that sort of thing. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit unknown, but I think there's just a, a very bright future ahead, not only for Tegas, but for the compliance organization within Tegas. I'm really excited to be a part of that. I'm really excited to lead that. Um, I think part of my excitement lies in the fact that I know that there's buy-in all the way across the top at Tegas. I think that's one of the most important things when you do have a, a compliance team or a legal team is that if you have the senior executive team who ha share the vision that you share, it makes it a heck of a lot more fun to do the job every day. Oh, it's really beautiful. I appreciate you sharing those perspectives and uh, I appreciate your time, Jason. Thanks for you know sharing your knowledge and uh, being here with us today. Yeah, it's fun. Thanks, Jake. I, I appreciate it. I'm sure this will be a lot more fun in the next several hours per week. We'll spend marathon training over the next few yeah. months. <laughs> but you know, in a strange way, I'm looking forward to that as well each week when I add another mile, it just feels, um, you know, like a little more realistic. Um, so I appreciate you being a good companion in that. Likewise, my friend. My biggest takeaway from today's episode is that in order to come into the fullness of who we want to be as leaders, we got to get out of the way. We have to move out of the way of organizational growth of the growth of our team and set down pride and ego when we can relinquish control and trust in the process, then we have the opportunity to be who we really want to be as leaders. Something I love that Jason does is the infusion of values into everything that they do at Tegas from the hiring process to policies and procedures and, and even the compliance aspect of things. When you have those core values there and you make it fun, then who's who's not going to enjoy investing in that? And, and that trust that's built between um, himself and those who he works with, I think is really beautiful and a fantastic lesson for all of us. How can we, you know, really create a template and a vision for what we want to create and then trust that when we let it go, when we set it in motion, that it will come to fruition. Of course, we're there to help guide and to, you know, reinforce boundaries as, as things go, but really to understand that it becomes its own thing and something more than, than just us. I learned a lot from Jason today. I'm sure you did as well. We would appreciate your likes, comments, and shares. 
Uh, if there's something that struck you today from this episode, I would encourage you to you know share that with your community, um, but more importantly, to take action on it. What's the one thing from this episode that you can really implement today that you can put into you know your next strategy session and and take tactical action on? Well, that's it for today. Thanks for your time. And until the next episode, be well.